Okay. Oh, just will, just will, just will. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, good, evening. Okay. good evening. Go ahead. You can say what you're going to say. Good, good <laughs> evening. No, I, I can ask for this Sunday if nothing happens. It's just something in reference to some flowers. That's oh. all. <laughs> how, are you, um, how are you doing in the family? Everybody's good. Thank you for asking. God bless you. Wonderful. 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 All right. Let me click a few buttons here and get everything going. I think we're live on Facebook. Still waiting for YouTube to pop up. And then we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Come on. Okay, looks like we are live. And I'm going to share the post. Come on. There we go. Okay. It's just weird the way it comes up now. I can't see who all is in the session like I used to be able to. If I switch to New Lives page. All right. Well, I do see three people there. I apologize to folks on Facebook. I, for some reason, my view isn't the same. I used to call out people's names. Okay. Ah, I think I got it now. All right. I see uh, the Campbells, Deacon and Deaconess are on. Uh, the Summers are on, Lamont and Pam. I see uh, Sister Jency is on. Good evening. God bless you. I know others will be joining. Welcome back to Midweek Bible Study. Um, we are going to do very hard to try and finish chapter one today. We, we don't have a whole lot left, but um, we'll, we'll be obedient. We'll see what God wants to do. But my, my goal is to finish chapter one tonight. Uh, so far, it's been an interesting read. Um, cause you to look at yourself, you know, and, and that's what this book is about. Taking an inside look and... Um, seeing where there's opportunity to change. It doesn't matter what level of Christian you are, how long you've been a Christian, there's always room to grow. There's always room to change. There's always room uh, for sanctification. And when we're sanctified, we glorify God. And so that ought to be our goals every day is to be more and more like Jesus. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Uh, before I pray, I do want to mention some special prayer requests. We're continuing to pray for uh, Brother Simulton, Brother Eric, uh, continue to pray for uh, the Mance family, uh, Brother Tyrone Mance. He lost his baby sister. I believe he said he already has lost a brother. He, I believe he's the oldest, so both of his siblings have passed. I believe they've already I think he even said a daughter of theirs has passed. So it's a tough time for him. I know they're traveling, so let's pray for them. 
Um, Sister Davidson, Sue Davidson, I believe she's in the hospital. Let's pray for her uh, recovery, uh, quick and full recovery in Jesus' name. Uh, I ask you to pray for me. I'll be traveling to Cleveland, Ohio on Friday. For, I'll be back Sunday night. Um, haven't been home to visit in a while, so I, I'm going to get on a big bird and fly up there. <laughs> and uh, just pray for my safety uh, and uh, pray for my family in my absence. Um, Sister Janaki is on. Good evening. Welcome. God bless you. All right. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, you know all the things that we need. Lord, you know our ups, you know our downs, you know our wants, you know our needs, the desires of our hearts. And so, Lord, we just ask you right now to meet us where we are, bless us uh, outside of what we deserve, give us your grace, um, give us your mercy. Lord, not that we're deserving, but because you're good. That's part of who you are. You are good. You are love. And you love unconditionally with an agape love. Father, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and lead us in your paths. Order our steps, O oh Lord. Father, the words that come out of our mouth, the meditation of our heart, may they be acceptable unto you as we're on our jobs, as we're at the grocery store, when we're sitting in a traffic light, when we're at home with our families. Uh, let us find opportunities to inject you into the conversation. People need to hear about you. You are not dead. You are yet alive and you're doing things in our midst. Father, bless us, protect us, provide for us. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our peace, Jehovah Shalom. You are uh, our defender. You're the author and the finisher of our faith. So, Lord, we just give you all the credit, all the glory. We pray for Pastor Cowan and First Lady Darlene. Continue to lift them up, hold them up as we approach Pastor's anniversary. Lord, we ask you to just touch and keep them. Keep them on the battlefield, Lord. Everyone who is on this call, whether by Zoom, by phone, by YouTube, on Facebook, Lord, bless us, bless our homes, bless our families. Lord, you know what we need better than we need for us, know what we need for ourselves. We love you, Lord, because you loved us first. Now, Lord, help us to read your word, to understand it better, know how much you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Let's uh, see. Sister Singleton is on. Good evening. God bless you. Welcome. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this picture and bring up our lesson for today. All right. Um, the last time we were here, we were talking about <clears throat> kind of uh, many times we fool ourselves. We think we're better than we are. And we have questions like, how do people feel about us? We're so self-centered. <laughs> we really are. Even as Christians, we're very self-focused. And you know what? That's natural. We have a self-preservationist mindset, but the Christian isn't called to preserve himself. The Christian is called to preserve Christ, which means giving of yourself. And a lot of times we don't want to do that. We don't want to give ourselves completely to God, let alone to uh, other human beings, our brothers and sisters, but we cannot be that way. I'm looking at the, okay, I'm looking at last week. I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. I'm trying to find the current broadcast. Okay, I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> we we, we got to look at our motives, according to the author of the book, as we interact with others. Um, we got to look at the deep-seated anger that we have inside against our parents, against our children, against our spouses. But he, he, um, the author talked about the nation of Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim in Hosea, how they had fooled themselves. They came from a very rich tradition. Ephraim was one of the sons of Joseph, and we know how special Joseph was. 
But Ephraim had gone astray, much like God's people often do. Um, he, he, in Hosea 7, verse 8, Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. And that's something we always got to be careful of. We are in this world, but not of this world. We cannot mix ourselves with this world. Uh, God, or through the prophet Hosea, described Ephraim as an as a half-baked cake. <laughs> that's what it says. Ephraim is a cake not turned. And that means they were half cooked. In other words, they, they started out right, but they didn't finish well. And it talks about how uh, their strength had been sapped because they were hanging around strange nations with false gods. And um, he describes in verse 11, Hosea 7, 11, Ephraim is like a silly dove without heart. And they run to Egypt and they go to Assyria. Why would you, why do we, let me, let's just bring it current. Why do we as God's people need to run to anything else but God? Why do we get our value and worth from anything, anything else but God's word? But we do. We often run after strange gods, little G's, right? We find our value in our own self-accomplishments instead of who God can, what God can accomplish through us, through us. And so like Ephraim, the author says, many times we're willing, willingly oblivious to our fallen spiritual condition. That's sad. That's sad. <laughs> um, many are spiritually deteriorated while convincing ourselves that what we're doing is right. Once again, we are right in line with pastor's theme to start off 2023, avoiding a, a, a seem right salvation. But many of us are on that path. Many believers, many churchgoers are on that seem right salvation. It might seem right, but it's not right. And so let's move into the new information today. The, the author says that our Lord reserved his harshest criticism for people who made denial into a trademark. And he goes in on the Pharisees. He talks about the Pharisees. He says the Pharisees specialized in looking good. They preserved their image by defining sin in terms of visible transgressions and then scrupulously adhering to the standards they established. Their joy was in the respect they received from others. They performed well. But Jesus had some choice words for the Pharisees. But before we get into that, I want to dig a little bit into here. You know, this is Bible study, and I've encouraged you all, anytime you're reading scripture, if you're in Bible study, you see something that you don't quite understand or don't know enough about, that's an opportunity for you to dig deeper. The Bible is not meant to, meant to be glossed over. The Bible is not a page turner. The Bible is meant to be meditated on, studied, dissected, digested, regurgitated. <laughs> I was talking to Kalani the other week, you know, when you get a good word, if it's not a good word for you, then tell somebody else, okay? <laughs> God, yeah, a good, the word is meant to be preached over and over again. And so, um, I want to show you a little video. It talks about who the Pharisees were, because as he's talking about the Pharisees, uh, I think we often think we know who they are. But uh, once again, this is Bible study. This is our time to learn, right? It's our time to study. So I'm going to bring up this video. Hopefully it'll play right. And it's a little video about the traditions of the Pharisees. And then we'll um, go to the next thing here. Let me go full screen. And hopefully you all will be able to hear this. Today, we're going to learn more about the Pharisees. It's important to know about them because Jesus spent a lot of time with them and it helps us understand many of the things that Jesus taught. The Pharisees 
and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. The Pharisees were a very influential Jewish religious group that started around 200 years before Jesus. They were lay people who dedicated themselves to studying and teaching the religious law. They were very highly respected by the common people, much more than the priests in Jerusalem. The Pharisees believed that in order to properly keep the law that is found in the Bible, it was important to keep hundreds of other more specific oral laws that had been handed down from previous generations. This is what Jesus refers to here as the tradition of the elders. Some of these laws had to do with washing your hands before eating and also washing cups and plates and so on. I guess that was good hygiene, but the Pharisees taught that these things were moral issues. In other words, if the people didn't do these things, they were committing a sin. The Pharisees were a very important source of authority for the people in the time of Jesus. They determined what the priorities and values were for their society, and so were a powerful and influential group of men. What are the sources of authority in our culture? It used to be the great institutions like the church, the government, and the education system. But what is it today? Is it the mass media? Are they the entertainment idols of our day? Or has our culture so lost its way that we have lost our sources of authority completely mm. so that it's whatever anyone wants to think or do? So what's your authority today? Here's the challenge for you. Are you willing to make the central source of your authority Jesus Christ and Him alone? Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, you learned a little bit about what the the traditions like washing hands. I mean, that was literally a sin to the Pharisees. If you ate without washing your hands, you were committing a sin. Yeah, okay, that might be good hygiene, right? <laughs> Especially during COVID, everybody was washing their hands. Hopefully people were washing their hands before, but you never know. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but the Pharisees were so le legalistic, you know. Uh, I still remember they they, they told, asked Jesus why his men were eating corn on the Sabbath day, because you had to work to get to the corn. You had to peel it and shuck it and and, and pick it. And that was considered a sin on the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees were always up in Jesus's business, right? Trying to catch him in a fault. They were very influential in that day. Um, now, in my research, every time I did a search for the Pharisees, who were the Pharisees, another group of people came up in my study and they were the Sadducees. The Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And once again, if you're doing Bible study, if you run into something you don't know what it is, follow that trail. You'll learn so much more about God's word when you do that. So I put together a little table here. We're going to go through this. Who were the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Okay. Um, so real quickly, the Pharisees, what was their main focus? Well, their main focus was the law, the law of Moses, the Torah, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, however you want to refer to it. The Pharisees were all about the law and how people carried out the law. The Sadducees' main focus was the temple, okay? The temple was their main focus because the Sadducees were of the priestly lineage, so they, they spent most of their time in the temple. Whereas the Pharisees, they're always 
snooping around the neighborhoods, trying to f- catch women in adultery, trying to find Jesus, breaking the uh, Sabbath day commandment. So there were two different groups, both at odds with Jesus, but the Sadducees rarely ever left the temple, whereas the Pharisees were out and about trying to catch people doing things wrong. What a, uh, <laughs> what a dilemma, right? All right, let's move on. The source of truth. What was the source of truth for the Pharisees? Their source of truth was not only the law, but the interpretation of the law. Now, anytime man gets involved with interpretation without the Holy Spirit guiding them, you're always subject to some flaws and things like that. So it's been well known and documented that the Pharisees added many things to the law of Moses. So with this interpretation of the law, how it was carried out and enacted, they also added things. They asked the people to do things that they themselves didn't even do. What about the Sadducees? Their source of truth was the law alone. They really didn't care. They weren't as involved as the Pharisees in what people were doing with the law. They just stayed in the temple, kept their noses in the book, and made sure everything was going right in the temple. What about their class and society? The Pharisees were considered to be middle class, where the Sadducees were considered to be upper class. Okay, Two different classes of people, two kind of different approaches to worship, and how to please God. What about the resurrection and the afterlife? Well, surprisingly enough, the Pharisees actually believed in the resurrection of the dead and an afterlife. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They just felt that when you die, your soul doesn't exist anymore. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why they weren't so bothered with Jesus. (laughs) I mean, how many times in scripture did you see the Pharisees, once again, confronting Jesus about things, asking him questions? They were intrigued by Jesus because he kind of, he believed like they believed, but his approach was much different. He didn't, in their eyes, he broke the law. Whereas the Sadducees, They didn't really care that much about Jesus. They probably thought he was just some kind of wacko like his predecessor, uh, John, John, uh, you know, the one eating locusts and wild honey. They didn't even believe in an afterlife. So I doubt they gave much credibility to who Jesus was. You don't read very often that the Sadducees chase Jesus down in question. It was always the Pharisees, the Pharisees. I'm going to I'm just going to throw this out there and others believe uh, what I'm about to say is that the Pharisees maybe in some ways get a bad rap. I'm not saying they were good people because they're not. We're going to see what Jesus thought about the Pharisees in just a minute when we go to the scripture. But you know the Pharisees were weren't they they were a little closer to Jesus than they were the, than the Sadducees were. Okay, at least they believed in a resurrection and an afterlife, but how that was going to happen, they probably didn't quite understand. But you know, Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. I believe Nicodemus got saved that night. I don't know if it's recorded anywhere, I believe he's mentioned later on. But Nicodemus was very curious and wanted to learn more from Jesus. He came to Jesus by night when nobody could see him. Mm -hmm. What about their standing with the Jewish leaders? Well, the Pharisees rejected the Jewish leaders. Huh, that's that's kind of in line with Jesus. So far, so far, the uh, the Pharisees really, you know, they believed in the law. Jesus believed in the law. Uh, They weren't rich people. They were middle class. So, you know, Jesus was not middle or upper. He was probably what you would call uh, uh, low income. (laughs) He was uh, he was blue collar. But, But Jesus believed in the afterlife and so did the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not in good standing with the Jewish leaders. Neither was Jesus. So the Pharisees had quite a bit in common with Christ. 
And that's probably why they're always chasing them around. What about the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees were upper class. They were very supportive of the Jewish leaders. They were very political in a sense, whereas the Pharisees were not. The Sanhedrin court, I forgot to change that. Ignore that piece there. <laughs> I forgot to change that. But the Sanhedrin court, they were members of the Sanhedrin court. And the, the Sadducees were also members of the Sanhedrin court. So you've got these two groups of people, quite different. But they both served up served on the Sanhedrin court. The Sanhedrin court was like the Supreme Court. It consisted of 70 members. The high priest at the time made 71. So the Sanhedrin court was very powerful in Jewish community. And so we see the Pharisees and Sadducees both sitting on that court. So you can imagine they probably disagreed on a lot of things. But one thing they did agree on was that uh, Jesus had to be killed. And so they, they came together on that and led to Jesus as being crucified. But we knew his crucifixion led to our salvation. Amen. All right. So there's a little background before we get in. Now, let, let's, let, let's see how Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. And once again, the context here is that many of us as Christians are living a steam right salvation life a seem right Christian life, and so were the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verse 25 through 26, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So once again, these Pharisees held high place in Jewish life, but Jesus called them out, called them hypocrites. He says, it's like drinking out of a dirty cup. You make it clean on the outside. Your plate is clean, but we know it's full of filthiness and a scandal, extortion and excess. Then he says, thou art blind, Pharisee. Cleanse first that which is within the cup in the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. This is pretty bold. Jesus called the Pharisees blind. In that chart we just looked at, the Pharisees took pride in their ability to interpret the scripture. They felt that they had a special ability to interpret the scripture and to manipulate the scripture, basically. But here Jesus calls them blind. A blind person, a person who doesn't see clearly, certainly cannot have a good interpretation of wisdom. And so for Jesus to call them blind, that was very offensive. For Jesus to call, their, call them hypocrites, they must have been very offended. Jesus goes on to say, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white, whited sepulchers. Now, sepulcher is a grave. So he says that they were whitewashed graves, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. My goodness. Jesus didn't play around. Jesus, Jesus spoke with the authority that God had given him, calling out the religious leaders of the day. Even so, in verse 28, even so ye are out, out, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The author says, in his rebuke of the Pharisees, our Lord declared a principle that must guide all our efforts to change into the person God wants us to be. So. I guess the warning tonight as we read this book inside out is be careful of be becoming like the Pharisees. You may have knowledge, but don't have the wisdom that comes with that knowledge that only comes from God. You may know the law, but then you begin to interpret the law your own way and apply it in ways that God may have never intended it. 
Let us be careful. Let us be careful. He made it clear that there is no place for pretense. This is what the author says. It seems to be his teaching that we can't make it if we don't face all that we are. Face it with honesty. That's what Jesus was asking the Pharisees to do, to look within themselves. He doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter how you look outwardly to men. It's what's on the inside that's most important. The author says we ought to face ourselves with honesty, no matter how painful it might be. We must face all that we prefer to deny. Mm. In other words, don't live your life in denial. You know you got problems. Guess what? God knows you have problems. <laughs> don't hide from him. Bring it to him. Let him clean you up. Turn it over to him. You know, the, there's times you just got to tell God, God, I hate this sin that has entrapped me. I hate the way I think. You see, until you learn to hate sin the way God hates sin, you'll continue to hold on to it. You'll continue to feed it. You'll continue to nurse it like a newborn baby. We take our sin and we cradle it. We wrap it up and keep it safe. We don't let other people touch it. We hide it. <laughs> but God wants us to expose our sin, expose it to him and allow him to remove it. Once again, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And we know that the mind that was in you is a righteous mind, a holy mind, a godly mind, a heavenly mind, a spiritual mind. Let us put aside those things that so easily distract us and get in our way. Once again, real change requires an inside look. All right, page 39 in my book um, is the section that says shallow copers versus troubled reflectors. Uh, that's one thing this author does. He, he, he paints pictures and categories for you to kind of see where you are on the spectrum. So are you a shallow coper or are you a troubled reflector? Let's take a look. People tend to fall into one or two categories. The shallow coper, these are those people who successfully ignore the inward ache and corruption and just get on more or less effectively with life. So they're ones who live their lives in denial like the Pharisees. They learn how to look good, talk right, do the right things, go to the right places, but inside they haven't really been changed. They can put on and take off their religion at will, and it, oh. ought, it ought not be that way. Romans 6, 1 through 3, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's a good question. <laughs> know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death? People don't like to talk about death, but the Christian embraces death for multiple reasons. We're called to die to sin. We're called to die to self so that we might be resurrected in the new life in Jesus Christ. So the believer, we practice dying all the time because we kill our sin. We kill our flesh by denying that flesh. The more we deny our flesh, the, gr the stronger our spirit grows. And the spirit man is then the head of our life, not the, the carnal man. You know, Paul addressed the carnal Christians. Even though they claim Christ, they basically have no power to live for him because they're carnal-minded. He says they're like new babes still drinking milk. We got to, we got to have some meat-eating Christians, <laughs> you know? Put that bottle away. Put the nipple down and pick up a knife and fork and start chewing on the word of God. You got teeth. <laughs> it's time to take our Christianity to another level. And so 
Um, yeah. <laughs> Continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. Of course not. But the shallow coper, they're not that concerned with their sin. They just kind of cover it up. You know, when um, I don't like doing house chores, I don't like to clean. And so anytime we have company, Rose says, that's the only time you clean when you know somebody's coming over here. <laughs> when our house was on the market over this past summer, you know, pretty much you didn't know when anybody would stop in. You, you may get a call 30 minutes. Hey, I'm bringing somebody by to look at the house. And so every morning before we left, we had to clean the house. I was spraying down the shower. I was wiping off the toilets. I was doing the dishes and sweeping and mopping the floor. And, and Rose was like, why can't you do this all the time? <laughs> uh, sometimes we're, it depends on how you're motivated. We ought to always keep our house clean for the Lord. Amen. 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 Because the Holy Spirit is constantly doing inspections. Yeah, David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. <laughs> and so we, too, must allow him to search. We, all, we, too, must keep our lives clean, not on the outside, but on the inside. Amen. Now, what about the troubled reflector? That was the shallow coper, those who find a way to make it without making any kind of change. A troubled reflector is at the opposite end of the spectrum. They are those who are gripped by an awareness that something is terribly wrong and struggle in their efforts to move along through life. A different, different side of the same coin. These are people that know there's something wrong. They know that they're a sinner, but they've allowed that guilt to keep them from living a productive and fruitful life. You see, the shallow coper, they see what's wrong, but they manage to fake it. And they're okay faking it, as long as everybody thinks they're okay. Well, the troubled reflector, they, they don't even have the wherewithal to muster enough fakeness. And so therefore, they don't even... They don't even have the gumption to, to come to church regularly because they feel so guilty. They have trouble loving other people because guilt has overcome them. They're gripped by the awareness of their sin. And they almost have given up and they think, well, there's no hope for me. God can't love me. There's no point in me going to church. If, and I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and they'll say, oh, I can't go to church. If I walked in there, the doors would fly off the hinges like they're the epitome of evil. Well, that's that's just an excuse that they use not to allow the, the surgeon to come in and fix their lives. What they don't understand is grace. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That first group, the shallow copers, yeah, they're all about their works because the works is all they have. They don't really have a relationship with Jesus. They're, they base their relationship with him based upon what others see externally. And then the second group, the troubled reflectors, they don't even know the love of God or they choose not to receive it, the free gift of God's love, the free gift of his grace. But Ephesians clearly says we're saved not by our works, but by God's grace. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't earn a gift. Gifts are given freely. And a gift is made especially for you. Nobody can take your gift if it's meant for you and if it's yours. You just have to receive it. Verse 10 of Ephesians 2, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So getting things in the right perspective, it starts with his grace and our faith. That's our only response. And when you respond properly to God's grace, 
then God will work through you. We are his workmanship. We're not our own workmanship. God wants to work through you. He's invested Christ on the cross so that you might walk in ordination before him. Amen, amen. All right. The author, oh, Sister Cheryl White, good evening. God bless you. The author goes on to say, the great majority of Christians would rather enjoy whatever is pleasant, do what we should do, and learn to endure whatever trials may come our way. The focus is to do what God commands with God's help, and that focus is right and proper. The priorities of obedience and dependence are essential for real change. <clears throat> But like the Pharisees, the author goes on, we reduce sin to manageable categories and expend all of our energy in maintaining the standards we set. You know, that's an exhausting life that you have to keep covering, keep covering, keep covering, keep covering. That's what Adam, Adam and Eve tried to cover, and their covering, the apron they made out of fig leaves was insufficient. Well, guess what? You're covering of what you think you're hiding, <laughs> it, it's exhausting. It's not permanent. It, it's not sufficient. Just like Pharisees, you know, we spend all our energy trying to look good on the outside while ignoring the dead man's bones on the inside, just like the Pharisees. Spirituality then comes to be measured by our works rather than by our an improvement in the quality of our relationships. And that the most important relationship, of course, is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Spirituality becomes measured by works. Spirituality, you know, James, James was a big advocate of works, but he understood the, the, the position. He understood our position in grace as well. But he says, you know, you claim you're saved. Well, show me your works. You know, uh, and Jesus even talked about the fruit that we bear. A tree is known by its fruit. If you are claiming to be a branch connected to the vine, then you ought to be producing some good fruit. If there's no fruit from your life, then you might not be connected. And any branch that's not connected will be cut and thrown into the fire. But make sure your work, your fruit, come from the right place, the right place of motivation, the right source. If you're, if you're faking it until you make it, at some point it's time to stop faking it and make it real. Amen? Amen. The author says, when this focus on measurable, superficial behavior serves to divert attention away from the real issues, we learn to cope instead of actually change. You know, just thinking about power, too. Why isn't the church more powerful? Why isn't the church more influential? My, why isn't my life your life. Why aren't we more powerful? Why aren't we greater change agents in this world? We have the spirit of God on the inside of us. Certainly God's power cannot be diminished. Then there must be something with, with us. Are we masking? Are we quenching? That's what the Bible says, that we quench the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, when we don't yield to the Holy Spirit. I believe I said it once before that God's not a bully. He's not going to make you do anything. He's, he'll give you plenty of opportunity to serve him. He'll bring people in your path you need to minister to, but you let that person go by. That was an opportunity. We don't have the power that God has put into us because we don't exercise it. I think it's just I think it's just that plain and simple. Mm -hmm. We become out of shape Christians. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
as the uh, author said earlier, deteriorated, apathetic. But in order to grow stronger, you have to exercise your faith. Put it to work. Put it to practice. That's how you get stronger. That's how you get more confident. Page 40, moving here. The author says the result when we really change is a... um, not not when we really change, but when we stay superficial, when we focus on measurable, superficial behavior, it diverts our attention away from real issues and we learn to cope instead of change. The result, now let me catch up, is a deep sense of pressure, not freedom. Wow, that's good right there. Anybody ever felt pressure to be good? <laughs> Anybody ever felt pressure to be right? And when I mean right, in other words, put on the right outward appearance to say the right things and do the right things. Being a Christian should not be a chore. At sometimes it is because our flesh wars against the spirit. But at some point, you ought to have some victories and feel like, you're in a good place with you and God. Amen. Praise. It shouldn't be hard to praise. It shouldn't be hard to pray. It shouldn't be hard to sing songs of Zion. Those Amen. things ought to flow from us. They ought to flow from us freely. Like worship almost should be like breathing. <laughs> it's not unless you have a physical condition breathing is not something you even think about doing is it yeah how many right. how many breaths have you taken in the last minute oh. you don't know you don't know because you're doing other things you're breathing it's automatic that's where we need to get to with our Christian relationship with God. It ought to be automatic. We, it shouldn't be something we have to think about. Ooh, oh, I got to stop this. I got to stop that. That's a miserable life. That's exhausting. Mm-hmm. Always looking over your own shoulder. <laughs> How about you get in line with God and keep your eyes on him and quit looking over your shoulder? Allow him to remove those things. He'll give you the strength to do it. He'll he'll provide that way of escape. The author says the route to real change is more often found by people who realistically face difficulties than by those who manage to preserve pleasant feelings by ignoring the tough things in their lives. Shallow copers, shallow copers may become troubled reflectors when something traumatic happens to upset their confidence in their ability to handle life. That's an interesting observation. So we talked about the two extremes, you know, the shallow coper. They've learned to fake it till they make it, not really interested in changing. And then we talked about the troubled reflectors. They're they're just so miserable at the truth of their sin that they don't even think they're worthy. And so they don't even try. Well, the author says if the right event happens in life, that a shallow coper can also become a trouble reflector. It reminds me of the, the man who built his house on sand. When the storms came, his house, his house uh, collapsed. Well, in the same way, a shallow coper, their life is shallow. They're not built upon a rock of their own faith. They're built upon keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with appearances, keeping up with sister so-and-so and and brother so-and-so. When they don't know what brother so-and-so and and brother sister so-and-so have gone through to get to where they are, they're measuring themselves against other people instead of what God is uh, 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 told them to do. And so the least uh, a calamity that comes in their lives, they can collapse, regress, backslide because their faith is not strong. 
the author says, yes, it's true that um, Oh, he, he I'm, I got sidetracked there. So the author talks about um, what does the 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 superficial Christian say to himself? And he kind of comes up with a scenario, a paraphrasing. So he says, this person will say, yes, it's true that my son is far from the Lord. But and we've done everything we know to do. But for now, Satan is getting the upper hand. We're just committing him to the Lord praying in faith that God will bring him back soon. And that sounds good. You know, maybe you said that about a wayward child, a wayward family member, a wayward friend from time to time. We just say, oh, well, there's nothing more I can do. Uh, uh, I'm, I just commit them to the Lord. I've said that. I've said that about people who I care about. It's like case closed. I'm wiping my hands. I'm wiping my hands of that situation without taking a look at our role in that person's life as a parent, as a son or daughter. Mm -hmm. What role did you play in that person's condition? That, that one kind of hit me in the gut <laughs> when I read that, because I'm sure I've said that about people. I think it's a cop out. It's a cop out that we as believers sometimes take that stance. Well, you know, I've done all I could. I told him about Jesus and I'll, I'll just pray for him. But is that enough? Is, is that all God calls us to do? Or are we supposed to get involved with people's lives? Are we supposed to disciple people? You can't disciple from a distance. That's the great commandment. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them and making disciples. Disciples, you don't give up on people. That's just something that for you to think about today. Who maybe who is that person that you've pretty much turned them over? You don't have the energy for it anymore. I'm raising my hand right now. I know there's people who I decided, well, that must not be for meant for me to minister to. I'm gonna move on. But you know what? What if Jesus moved on from you? <laughs> what if he took it? What if he took his spirit from you? He doesn't give up on us. All right, page 41. We're getting close to the end here. Too often a commitment to obedience reflects not a passionate desire to pursue God, but a stubbornly fearful determination to not feel deep frustration and personal pain. Once again, we take the path of least resistance, even as Christians. We become rigid moralists who push people to keep God's standards rather than passionate Christians who entice others to know Christ better. What is the measure of obedience to God? That's a good question. John 15, verses 12 through 13. John 15, 12 and 13 says... This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that oh. a man lay down his life for his friends. Are we truly being obedient? Are we truly loving? Or are we just superficial? Hi and bye, and I'll pray for you. Oh, you only you can answer that question. I'm the author put it out there. I'm just throwing it out there to us. Galatians, this is we're talking about the true measure of obedience to God. Number one is to love. Love, love one another. That's 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 the great commandment. And lay down your life if need be. Um, Galatians 5, 13 through 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There it is again. You know, as Christians, we are free from the law. We're free from the penalty of sin. We're free from the law because God writes the law of love in our hearts. 
uh, I believe it was James or maybe it was Peter talked about being blameless. Nobody should be able to find fault with you if you're truly living in a way that that Christ lived. Blameless. They found no fault with Jesus, but because the people wanted him dead, those who were threatened by him, he was crucified. And so in the same way, people should not be able, you should live blameless with love as our number one, uh, uh, number one priority. First Peter 1 and 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth, the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So what is the measure of obedience to God? Four love. letters. Yes, L O V E. And you know what? Love is also four letters in Spanish. Amor. A M R. <laughs> That's a four letter word we all should love and fall in love with and use. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap this up here. Chapter one. So the author finishes. He says, change requires an inside look. More and more people are having trouble maintaining a comfortable adjustment based on denial. We say that life is too confusing. Relationships are too difficult. Experiences are too disappointing. Isn't that the truth? I mean, once again, this the author is right on my street. I say some of these things all the time. Responsibilities are too burdensome. Here he talks about women in general. Women find that their womanhood is a neutral fact instead of a unique source of joy. They have a deep fear of being hurt that keeps them from enjoying their opportunities to give of themselves. So the author is saying, in a generic sense, women have been given a gift of giving, of sharing. There's nothing like a mother's love, right? Um. Mm -hmm. I know when we had babies, uh, Rose could barely sleep. You know, me, I'd be out like a light. I didn't hear you. <laughs> a, a, a woman tends to the needs of those that are helpless and hurting. It's a gift. Nurture. Women are our nurturers, right? But he says many women, many women today have been so hurt and scorned that they don't even... They don't have the pride in their unique gifting. Then men, mm -hmm. 42, he says, men feel weak in which they knew how to be meaningfully involved with their families. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. our, efforts are, our efforts to lovingly lead end up in failure. As a result, we retreat to whatever aspect of life gives us a sense of competence without the rich joy of being involved as husbands and fathers. Careers, you know, men are, are men are very outward focused, accomplishment focused. Women, in contrast, are very inward focused, very home focused. And that's just in generic sense. And some people may disagree with that, but you know, uh, it is possible to change at the core. Is it possible to change at the core of our being? The Bible asks the question, can a leopard change his spots? If so, how much change can we inspect, expect? Well, one thing we do know, real change requires an inside look. What do the following verses suggest about starting a place for change? Let's look at James, Jesus's brother. James 1 and 5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know, uh, that's very powerful what James says there. If you need help, ask God. You know, we're not asked to have blind faith. You've heard of blind faith. Well, that's not what Christianity requires. You're not asked to have blind faith. The Bible says to have the faith of a child. God wants us to ask him questions. Any of you who have toddlers, boy, a toddler will ask you a bunch of questions. Yes, Lord. 
<laughs> but you know what? God wants us to come to him and ask him questions. He, he wants to be our counsel. He wants to give us answers. But so we ought to, it's not blind faith. It's childlike faith. What is childlike faith? Well, you ask God for the answer and you take his answer at his word. A, a, a child, a baby, a youngster will believe anything you tell them. Mm-hmm. Because their minds are untainted, their minds are pure. They're trusting. They're they they're believing. They have no pretense, and that's how God wants us to come to Him. We may not like the answer, <laughs> but we ought to trust Him for the solution. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Last verse, James four and ten. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and it all starts right there with humility. How many humans, how many humans, how many people today refuse to humble themselves? First of all, they refuse to admit that they're sinners. They think, oh, I'm all right. I'm better than my neighbor. I'm I'm better than half of those people that go to church. I've heard people say that. All those hypocrites at the church. Well, well, come on to church and show us how to live since you're so good. (laughs) <laughs> but humble yourself humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he shall lift you up too many of us too many of us elevate ourselves and once again we believe our own press clippings what people say about us good or bad we ought to let praise just like criticism roll off our backs like water off a duck Let the Lord lift you up. Get your self-esteem from the word of God and learn that you're loved. Learn that you're forgiven. Learn that guilt has no place in the life of a believer. Brothers and sisters, our time is up and we have finished chapter one. Uh, That was a good chapter. A lot of good meat in there. uh, Causing us us to look who are you? I'll just leave you with that question. Who are you? Do you know who you are? <laughs> uh, he gave us many different ways to define ourselves. And the point of this book is not to stay who you are today, but to grow, to change, to evolve, to get closer in your walk with the Lord. And I pray that you all stick with us on this journey. Amen. 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 All right. Um, continuing to pray once again to the Mance family, Sister Davidson, um, Brother Eric, um, everyone who's on the call. Any other special prayer requests? If anyone. Keith oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go uh, say that again. I'm sorry. Keith Jackson. All right. All right. Any other? Amen. Well, while I'm sitting here, I just got a message from Sister Sue. Um, she is back home. Praise God. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Yes, Thank you. Back home. She's thankful for all the prayers. I'm reading her message here on Facebook. It uh, feels good to be back home and in her own bed. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> God is good. Mm-hmm. Many times people go to the hospital mm-hmm. and you know they don't come out. But it's mm-hmm. good. It's good. God is good. He has raised her up and she's back home. All right. Well, let's continue to pray for her healing and uh, those that are traveling. I, I know the Mances once again, they got heavy hearts with the loss of uh, Tyrone's sister. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you. We love you beyond compare because you love us beyond reason, (laughs) because we certainly mess up. We have faults and flaws. We purposely look beyond ourselves many times and put on a mask. But Lord, we're asking you to help us to take off the mask tonight, peel back the layers of ourself. Let us get to the true self, who we are at our core. And Father, we need a washing. We need a cleansing. We need a new birth. We need regeneration. 
We need rest. So, Lord, we come on. We invite you into the house. Clean up, Father, from the top to the bottom. Make us more like Christ. Lord, we yield ourselves to you tonight. We are ready for change. We want to think different. We want to be different, not just act different, because anybody, Lord, can put on a show. But, Lord, we're not here for show. show. We're here for sure. <laughs> we're not here for show. We're here for sure. And so, Lord, we just thank you. We love you. We praise you. We just thank you for your patience with us. Lord, mold us and make us into a vessel that can be used, pour it in, and then pour it out. Break us like that bread in communion. Father, break us, bless us, and then give us. Lord, this world is hurting. We're continuing to hear about shooting, mass shootings, wars and rumors of wars in the Middle East, in Russia and Ukraine. Oh, Lord, all we got to do is just turn on the news and we can see that this world is broken. This world is hurting. People have no peace. People have no joy. But we who are your people, we have joy. We have yeah. blessings. We have a joy that the world can't take away. The world didn't give it. Lord, let us spread this light, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, keep us, protect us, provide for us. All the things that you're so good at, Father, we just thank you right now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, you know. touch each and every one right now. If I could lay hands on them, I would. But Lord, I know that your hand is upon them. I thank you for the obedience of the saints to tune in, to be taught. I thank you, Lord, for teaching. I thank you for your spirit. Remind us, Lord, who we are and whose we are. Lord, we go forward mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 All right, everyone. Be well, be safe, be blessed. Love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you all too. Love you. Have a great night. Love you. All right. Thank you. Praise God.